Hi, this is Naomi with Sword and Steel, and today we are going to be checking out how to assemble Commander Farsight from the new Tau boarding patrol. If you do want that boarding patrol, oh my goodness, you probably should have already jumped on it, but you uh, might want to jump on it as soon as possible. Uh, grab, go to your local game store, see if they have some, or put your name down for if there might be a chance to restock them in the future let them know that you want it uh, because these guys currently are limited of course they'll be coming out with him in the future so this wouldn't be uh, a last chance to get him but we're not certain when that'll be so if you want him if you can't wait then you had best go get him now <laughs> Since the specific rules for everything Warhammer 40,000 will be adjusted come this summer, I thought I'd just touch on the rules you could expect regardless of edition for Commander Farsight, and then chat about the lore behind Commander Farsight himself after I go over some items of note for assembling this miniature. First, this would not be a model for a new person if they've never assembled a model before. If you're building this out of the boarding patrol, I would suggest the other crises battle suits first then the Tau Fire Warriors, and then this character. Now, for Commander Farsight, there are some itty bitty pieces to him that if you lose, you will miss. Like his inner toes. They're so tiny. I would suggest getting a pair of curved tweezers for attaching these pieces to the model. And if you're going to have a Tau Empire army anyway, then you'll want the tweezers for your Tau Fire Warriors and a whole bunch of other Tau guys because Tau have lots of bits and bobs hanging off of them that is just easier to attach with the aid of tweezers. Now for the most part everything on Commander Farsight fits together very well as in you can determine exactly where it goes as long as you follow the guide and you do some dry fitting first and by dry fitting I mean placing piece against the other piece as if you were going to assemble it and then when you know exactly how it's supposed to go that's when you add the glue to one side and attach the other side to it. This allows for you to always get where it goes correctly and figure out where you have to put the glue every time. Now as I said most everywhere fits together very well just dry fit and then glue together but there are some areas where you may be unsure how it goes together. The first one is exactly how his legs are oriented because he has a very specific rock that he has to stand on. It'd be kind of awkward if one of his legs didn't touch the rock. Thankfully, there are notches in the stone base, the rock base, that he will be standing on and you can slot his feet into those notches into the stone. I did it while it was still on the sprue and this will allow the Commander Farsight's legs to dry in the right position. The next questionable placement is the torso to the legs. I believe the peg on mine that attaches the two pieces together is too long for the hole it's supposed to fit into so it never glued properly because there was no good fit between the two pieces until I cut the peg down and used a liberal amount of glue at the connection point. And lastly, his arms at the shoulders attach very awkwardly into these ringed sockets. There are tiny bumps, and I mean tiny bumps, on the curves of his shoulders that are supposed to fit into just as tiny divots inside the rings that will encompass the shoulders. But because they're so tiny and because the balls of his shoulders are actually larger than the rings that they need to fit into because it's only supposed to fit in so far, it's hard to place the arms properly if you're following where the tiny divots are supposed to match up with the tiny bumps. So I think you could save yourself some strife and actually assemble each of his arms first, glue the arms into the rings, and then glue the rings to his torso. So you want to skip the last part of 2A step and 2B step until you have his arms created. 
and that's when you can attach his arms if you wanted to follow the way that he's holding his weapons like it is in the guide or in the original art for the box. If you instead want to orient his weapons in some other fashion, which you certainly can do, just ignore the bumps because they're really not going to get in your way because they're so small or just shave them off if you prefer and orient it as you like. Oh, and his jets, the jets that are on the, the back that some people might want to keep off during painting, his jets actually attach to the rings that are attached to his arms. So you can keep the rings, arms, and jets off for sub-assembly painting if you wish to with great ease and then glue it on later, which you might want to do since there is a crevice in between his shoulder, rounded shoulders, and his torso, a purpose created crevice so you may want to do that anyway and you can do that with keeping his jets off as well as his arms and still have it all as the one piece. I really like this model I think it's gorgeous and I like the addition of the sakura bushes a lot though if they don't work for you the bushes or the branches are completely separate from the rock so you can choose to keep them off if you so wish and the rock looks complete whether you have them on or not. And that should be about all that you really need to know. And if you had any questions about a particular part of assembling him, just ask in case you were wondering. Oh, and there are no extra pieces for Commander Farsight to use everything on the sprue. All right, so Commander Farsight, his rules are for the next few months, but when 10th edition hits, he could certainly see some changes. Well, he will see some changes, but mostly how he works will be the same. It says that Commander Farsight, his faction keywords are Tau Empire and Farsight Enclaves. So he is part of the Farsight Enclaves, but you can use them in other septs. You just don't get the sept bonus. The sept bonus isn't given to Commander Farsight. All right, uh, his keywords are infantry, character, battlesuit, fly, jetpack, commander, and Farsight. And those are relevant for his the stratagems that you might use with him. So when you're contemplating building your army, you want to go through the stratagems and check out for those keywords to see if you can use them with Commander Farsight. Okay, so he has a 10 inch movement, two plus weapon skill, two plus velocity skill, five strength, five toughness, seven wounds, five attacks, 10 leadership, and a three plus save, which is great. He is equipped with a high intensity plasma rifle and his dawn blade, a very special weapon his dawn blade your army can only include one commander farsight model so his high intensity plasma rifle is a 36 inch range assault two and assault just means that he can advance and still shoot with a minus one penalty the strength is eight ap minus four and three damage per shot oh well per successful hit and then the Dawn Blade, you have two options and you choose which one you want to use when you're in combat. Since you have five attacks, you choose how you want to uh, select them. So strike is times two strength, so 10 strength, AP minus three, three damage each. And again, that's five attacks, that's super nasty. And I would use it against, of course, high toughness characters that have a lot of uh, wounds. On the other hand, you could do a sweep, which is a strength of six, AP minus two, one damage each, and each time an attack is made with this weapon profile, make two hit rolls instead of one. So you have, uh, if you chose to use just sweep, then he would have 10 attacks, a strength six, AP minus two, one damage. So against horde, small infantry models, that would be. Now his abilities are battle suits and Manta Strike, which is currently on page 93. And you know, while we have the time, why don't we just go check that out? Battle suits. Battle suit models in this unit can make attacks with ranged weapons even when their unit is within engagement range of enemy units, but they can only make such attacks against enemy units that they are within engagement range of, so just like vehicles. In such circumstances, those models can target an enemy unit even if other friendly ar units are within engagement range of the same enemy unit. 
Note that if a battlesuit model has more than one ranged weapon, you can still choose to target units that are not within engagement range of its unit, but it will only be able to make the attacks with that weapon if all enemy units within engagement range of its unit have been destroyed when you come to resolve those attacks. In addition, when a battlesuit model shoots a heavy weapon, subtract one from the hit rolls when, when resolving that weapon's attacks while any enemy units are within engagement range of that model. Now you don't have to worry about that because he has an assault weapon, not a heavy weapon. So that's very nice that he can shoot on in combat. That's lovely. That's a nice um, additional two hits and potentially six damage to be smacked on. So I think I'd really like to hit something heavy. Because you go on in, you shoot at him with your 36 inch range, you charge in, and then you strike five times with that Dawn Blade, and that is super vicious. And I haven't even gotten to the rest of his abilities yet. Alright, Manta Strike. During deployment, you can set up this unit in a Manta Hold instead of setting it up on the battlefield. If you do, then in the reinforcement steps, uh, of one of your movement phases, you can set this unit anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches away from any enemy models, which is lovely. Okay, so those were his um, basic abilities just for being in a battle suit, basically. And now he also has tactical acumen. In your command phase, you can select one friendly crisis core unit within nine inches of this crisis battlesuit commander until the end of the turn. That unit is eligible to shoot and declare a charge within a turn in which it fell back, which is always nice because tactically advantaged stuff is good. Each time a core model in that unit makes a ranged attack, you can ignore any or all hit roll modifiers. It means they could run, if they had assault weapons, they could run and not worry about the minus one to hit. Or stuff like that are some models that give a minus one to hit. You could ignore it. Way of the short blade. At the start of the fight phase, you can select one friendly Farsight Enclave's core unit. Uh, so this one is specifically Farsight Enclave's core unit, meaning it's more likely that you want to play with Farsight Enclave's. Yeah, it looks like there's another one that is specifically Farsight Enclave core. So you do have to consider that when choosing Commander Farsight. There are two of his abilities are specifically for Farsight Enclave core units. Not that there's anything wrong with you choosing that sect, because I like that sect. Way of the Short Blade. At the start of the fight phase, you can select one friendly Farsight Enclave core unit within six inches of this model until the end of the phase. Each time a core model in that unit makes an attack, add one to the attack's hit roll, which is lovely. So just keep yourself within six inches of Commander Farsight. Lovely. Master of War. Aura. While a friendly Farsight Enclave core unit is within six inches of this model, each time a core model in that unit makes an attack roll, reroll hit rolls of one. So you get to add one to the attack and you get to reroll hit rolls of one. So whether they be attacking with shooting or attacking with fighting. So that's great. You reroll hit rolls of one and you get a plus one to your hit roll, so that's super powerful. I like that. The boarding patrol that has additional crisis battle suits in with him makes so much sense for what he can do. All right, Enclave Commander, if your army is Battleforged, this model must be your army's warlord, which makes sense because he's Commander Farsight. If more than one model in your army has rule to this effect, then one of these models must be your army's warlord. And then Shield Generator, this model has a 4 plus invulnerable save. And if you're still new, invulnerable save means that you can ignore AP of your enemy should you wish to. So this, I think he's a really great model. I think in 10th edition when his rules change, you'll see something like that. We don't know what it's going to come out to. There may have been some FAQ since, so you want to check that too, but... That gives you a great idea of what he could be like. He seems to be absolutely nasty in combat. In melee combat, I mean. Which is really nice for the tower, since most of your tower is going to be ranged. So having a 
kind of like deep strike unit that gets right in there is useful. Okay, the background of Commander Farsight. Well, first of all, there are five castes in Tau Society. Fire, Earth, Air, Water, and Ethereal. And Farsight, like most every other Tau you'll find on the battlefield, is part of the Fire caste, the Warrior caste of the Tau. Commander Farsight's name is, in fact, Chasse au Virola Chauva Case Montier, but he is normally named simply Oshova. Chasse represents his caste, O represents his rank, Viorla represents the sept world Farsight was born on, long before he ever formed the Farsight enclaves, and Chauva, Case, and Montier are the names he earned for himself. Farsight has had a long and complex history which spans across several novels, if you ever would like to read them. But let me at least share some of the key aspects of his history. First of all, Farsight has always been talented. He trained under a world's renowned Tau commander named Commander Puritide, and Farsight wasn't alone in his apprenticeship. He had a long time rivalry going with another incredibly talented Tau, a nice little firecast female who would be later known as Commander Shadowsun. Farsight spent years under Pure Tide's tutelage and Shadow Sun's rivalry, learning and mastering every fighting technique known to Tao society, though he always leaned towards the more aggressive, deep strike like form of Montka. By the time he left Pure Tide's council, he was the rank of commander. It wasn't until years later when he successfully predicted over and over and over again the intentions of the orcs the Tau were trying to clear from the world of Arknasha that he became known as Farsight. It wasn't some supernatural ability that allowed him to predict the orcs' movement. No, he spent so much time meticulously studying every aspect of their behavior and testing his theories in combats. That's how he learns his opponents. He did the same with the Imperium of Man when he had to fight them. There is unlikely a Tau who knows orcs more than Farsight does. And during those many relentless combats with the orcs, I believe that is when Farsight first began to see the Ethereals as something less than the almost deity-like cast that the majority of Tau society view them as. Eventually, he became the first commander to disobey a direct order from the Ethereal Council. When he became aware of orc infestations in the area of his expedition, he had to recolonize Tau worlds that had been lost to the Imperium. And instead of doing that, he chose to exterminate the infestations of orcs he'd found in that area and save many Tau in the process, though he also lost a lot. Not that he has ever taken any Tau's life for granted, which is probably another reason that he and the Ethereal have not always gotten along, since they seem to be much more sacrificial of Tau life than he has ever believed to be right. And eventually, he separated completely from the Empire. He thought for the Empire's own good, and during that time, the Farsight enclaves were formed on the opposite side of the Damascles Gulf to the Empire. Well, regardless of his inevitable eradicated status, Farsight is still loyal to the idea that every Tau life should be saved if it can be. He's come to the Empire's aid, whether they wanted it or not, multiple times over his very long, long life. I say long because despite the Tau having generally a shorter lifespan than the average human, Farsight has lived for centuries. This is something he currently doesn't delve too deeply into, though in truth it's due to his Dawn Blade, an artifact he picked up a long time ago with an unknown origin. I say unknown origin with quotation marks. I actually suspect it's some kind of corn blade just from the descriptions of what he fought. I'm not sure, but I think it's Corn Blade. Well, in the end, I'm a big fan of Farsight. What do you think of him? And isn't his model great?
I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe if you enjoy content like this, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye! Thank you to all the patrons who put up with me. <laughs> I hope you have a fantastic April Fools. And oh, I've started the membership program on YouTube. So if anyone wants to join in for emojis, not like this one, but for emojis and supporting the channel, that would be great. Okay, bye. Am I going to be painting Commander Farsight in his iconic red Crisis Battle suit? Absolutely kind of have to, don't you? But I think I'd be doing it in like a, not this engine red, but a commander farsight red. An alien red.